let's take a look at creation versus evolution. Uh, just a reminder, what God said in his word, his invi invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. For those of you who weren't here last week, uh, last time, this is just a couple of slides from last time. Why is it important? Because so, that was the first time I ran this class. I'm like, why is this important? Well, evolution opposes what God's word says, first and foremost. And it seeks to take away God's glory as the awesome creator of the universe. Christian theology and salvation is absolutely based on historical Adam and Eve with Adam as a representative of the human race, of mankind. That is absolutely. Without that, Christian theology crumbles. Evangelism, people have to know that there is a God who matters. Uh, the words of each person, are we created by a person-loving God or a random genetic accident as evolutionaries? Uh, George J. Lord Simpson wrote, man is a result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. He was not planned. It's not encouraging. Francis Schaeffer stated that if he only one hour of sin with a believer, he would devote 55 minutes to what it means to bear the image of God. Also, our worldview. Uh, it shapes our worldview about what is important. And then, this is my Father's world. If we see that, uh, we need to believe it. Let's define the terms. Naturalism is actually more of an all-encompassing term. Naturalism is the view that every law and force operating in the universe is natural rather than moral, spiritual, or supernatural. In other words, take every consideration of anything moral or supernatural out. Macro evolution is the idea that all life on Earth arose from a single cell. You'll see this in a moment. Common descent with modification. That's the term I'm going to use when I refer to evolution. Darwin's tree of life. Uh, I've got a couple other pictures. What this is, all life, according to Darwin, came from a single cell, common descent with modification. You had the origin of life here, which they still don't know how to explain that. And then what happened is that there was some bacteria that was formed, and over time it developed more traits and characteristics, and all of a sudden it became something else. Like the first organism would have been a lot of like a sponge, you know, sea sponge, and then kept mutating and having different types of sponges, and one day it became a jellyfish. And then, you know, started trees branching off from all that, and they have a little color coded where you can trace it all. You know, with it branched off here, you got plants, then this, molds, and then, oh, you come down here, and then you got the dinosaurs, and then you got, you know, apes, humans, and here we are. The principal mechanism has been natural selection based on undirected mutation. That's real important. And according to Darwin's theory, unguided processes are sufficient to explain all features of life. And as Richard Dawkins said, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. You know, he was an atheist and he, oh, there's a theory that fits. This is actually a modification of what was in Darwin's book. You know, everything started way down here, and you had branches, and then they've actually got it labeled as to what things would be. The space between these would be thousands of generations, at least. So you got a tremendous amount of time. And okay, they try to trace branches of who we are uh, back to that. Or as someone has said, this is a graphical presentation, we go from the goo to you via the zoo. So. <laughs> but microevolution, evolution just means change. This is a dolphin. It's not a different species. It is a dolphin, but a dolphin without the dorsal fin. But it, this was taken off the coast of Chile, probably. Not by me. But it was taken off the coast of Chile, but it's a dolphin. So obviously it looks different and it's got a nice paint job than any dolphin you'll see in the Gulf. But it is still a dolphin. Changes within species are changes in kind. Changes in very distinct limits. Variation is not evolution. Just think of the tremendous 
just look around. Just look at the tremendous variation we see in people. <laughs> I am so blessed, so glad that when I had to pick somebody to represent Caucasian people that matched the flair and style of everybody else in this picture, I did not need Google Images. <laughs> All I need to do is go to the, to the early service with a cell phone camera. I thought Casey was going to be here. She was happy. I'm going to email this to, to her. With, and I think I can put it in a PDF format. But uh, a very worthy representative here. But everybody else, I have to go to Google Images. <laughs> Just look, I mean, all the different types of animals, you know, these are all dogs, different, you know, breeds and all this, but they're all dogs. They're wonderful dogs. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then my personal favorite, besides the, with that, eagles and then the big cats, tigers, lions, panthers, jaguars, uh, cheetahs, all this. Not just the tremendous, I love to watch these animals. These are tremendous animals. And one thing we'll get into shortly, mutations are not always good. And we'll see that, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but you, know, you start with these magnificent creatures of God, all these big cats, and you combine the awful effects of sin and mutations going horribly wrong, and you come up with cat wannabes, or you may call them house cats. <laughs> you know, I, we have two. They bring me a mole and expect me to leave it on the front porch and expect me to be impressed. I keep telling them, bring me a wildebeest or a zebra, I'll be impressed. But these are, you know, the cat wannabes. Evolution depends on four things a lot of time, chance, random mutations, and natural selection. In other words, survival of the fittest. Time. Listen to this from George Wall. One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to conceive that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. You remember I said the origin of life they couldn't explain? Yet, here we are. As a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation, <coughs> which he just said was impossible. Why? He says, time is a hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal with is on the order of two billion years. What we regard on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. Only One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. That's their thing. Last week, remember we said one aspect of uh, the evolution is like if a tornado went through a junkyard and out came a 747. And that's actually a pretty good analogy. I don't care how many billions of years you've got, it's just not going to happen. But they think, hey, given enough time, anything can happen. <coughs> also, one thing is chance. And a lot of times, like, almost chance is a determining force. <coughs> so, but chance deals with mathematical probability. Thank you. But for one, I found out I didn't need it, so thank you anyway. Chance deals with mathematical probability, but chance is not a force. It's just a statement of what it is. It determines nothing. Naturalists impute to chance the ability to cause and determine what occurs. That happens a whole lot. But there's no reason to believe that a blind natural process could ever produce something as complex as a simple cell. Just wait till the Week five, when we talk about cells, it, it is just beyond what you can imagine. How did blind chemistry produce intelligence, emotions, altruism, or morality? Which is another thing we'll touch on. Mutations. Mutations, that's copious error, so, so to speak, in DNA. It's, you know, something happened and something went wrong. They're usually detrimental and often lethal, and that's where a lot of diseases come from. Uh, but some may actually be beneficial under certain conditions. You may actually have some change that benefits, uh, at least on a temporary 
some organisms oscillate between uh, change. Mutations are generally neutral. In other words, there's no change in cellular activity. When you think about it's a change in the computer code that's billions of lines long, you change one line in there, and it may be, yeah, they can handle it. Or they re re it's reduce pre-existing cellular activity. In other words, they've got a function and they take it away. The opposite of what evolution requires, you know, antibiotic resistance. Yes, bacteria will resist antibodies a lot of times, but there's generally a loss of information. You know, they'll throw everything but the kitchen sink at an antibody. And they may resist it, but they've lost some, uh, they've lost some capabilities. Lots. You know, these neutral mutations, there's only so much that a species can handle, or an organism can handle. If you're talking on the order of millions and billions of years, all these neutral mutations will kill a species. They kind of gloss over that. In all the scientific data, there's no unambiguous example of a mutation that accounts for origin of specific cellular activities. None. In other words, there's no scientific data that shows where a cell developed a different activity because of mutation. Uh, your friends at creation.com, if I'm going to plagiarize, I might as well quote them. It says, how can mutations, accidental copying mistakes, DNA letters exchanged, deleted or added, genes duplicated, chromosome inversions, you know, that type of thing, create the huge volumes of information in the DNA of living things? How could such errors create three billion letters of DNA information to change a microbe to a microbiologist? You know, you're talking, remember I said you're going from the goo to you, which is, tremendous information. We have yet to find a mutation that makes microbes to man evolution to be feasible. Even if those rare instances where mutation confers an advantage, they almost always cause a loss of information. That's what I referred to in a moment. Let me give you an example or an illustration. I'm going to go way back. My very first car radio tape player was an 8-track. I know most of you remember the old A-tracks, okay? When they assemble these things, they had, I'm sure, assembly instructions. One thing that did not happen was one day somebody gets one and accidentally there was an additional assembly instruction on how to make a USB port and add the USB port to the A-track player. Because there was no such thing as a USB port, people didn't have personal computers, nothing. Well, it would have been an advantage, but you just didn't have that. Nor did you have wholesale changes. So somebody gets their instruction and goes, oh, what's this? And it ends up being, they put it together, oh, this is a CD player. And they get it out to market. Not that anybody had CDs, but, you know, people said, hey, I like this. This is great. I think this is an advantage over 8-track. Of course, smoke signals were advantage over 8-track, but still, you know. <laughs> This is an advantage over a track. So, hey, we're going to start buying this, and that's how survival of the fittest happened, and you know, everybody started buying CDs. That's not how it happened. And you may think, well, that's silly. That's no more far-fetched than some of the things you have to believe in evolutionary theory. That random mutation all of a sudden created, or oh, not created, copied things differently, and Voila, you had a new something. You know, USB port and an 8-track player. You know, it just didn't happen. But, you know, there are some intelligent, well, some uh, intellectually honest people. At the 1996 Wistar Institute, a mathematician stated it is, and that, you know, they had gone through a whole series of things. It is our contention that if random, Remember, random mutation is given a serious and crucial interpretation from a probabilist, probabilistic point of view. The randomness postulate is highly implausible and that an adequate scientific theory of evolution must await the discovery of new laws, physical, physiochemical, and biological. 
What do you just believe God is? Uh, mathematicians contend that the increase in complexity and the progress that has supposedly been accomplished by evolution through random changes would require a length of time billions of times longer than three billion years. Wow. So do mathematicians talk to biologists in Canada? I don't think they, I think they just, I don't believe that. Like if the quote we had last week, even if all data pointed toward creation, they would discount it because it's not a naturalistic formula. But yes, they did do that, and they just, what happens in scientific journals, they start trying to shoot holes in these types of theories. That's generally what happens. But I mean, and it's true, because the more people have discovered the complexity of, of life, it's like, well, oh, guys, this, if, it, if you think of this evolved <laughs> over this many billions of years, you've got to do more. Good question. All natural selection can do, and like this is a survival of fittest, is select among features that are already present. That is, that is not what is implied in all the textbooks. Well, we just developed a, you know, a new weapon system, and so we survived. You know that, you know, as far as this organisms, that's not what happened. All they can do is take away from the existing data. Like I said, the DNA copy thing. It's a weeding out system. It's not a developmental system. New traits develop if enough genetic information is eliminated. New features and traits already <coughs> in the gene pool. Like I showed you all the dogs. You know, over time you're going to have certain ones that just long hair goes away. You know, and you've got short hair dogs. You know, a, a certain breed. Plus, any characteristic can be an advantage in a lot of ways. You, you can almost say, well, this is an advantage. And then one I thought of, uh, how can natural selection explain presence of defenseless and dependent sheep? I mean, that is a fully developed animal. They're, it, they're dumb. They're defenseless. They need us. They need sheep herders. How did they, how would something like that develop without any defense mechanisms? It's just my thought. I never read that, but I just thought of that. You can tell the difference between the, you know, PhDs and people like that that do the questions and me. <laughs> kind of like the comedian that said, yeah, his wife contemplated the big issues of life, like where we are, where we come from, who we are, where we're going, and I just wonder how they get Teflon to stick to the pan. So, <laughs> yeah. So when you come up with something like this, you will know that it was me. <laughs> The death of individuals not adapted to an environment and the survival of those who are suited does not explain the origin of those traits that make the organism adapt. In other words, just because something survived doesn't mean that that organism had the traits that made it survive. Or how it got those traits. It just it doesn't explain well, why some survived one did. It could be environmental. It could be any number of things. And cells, highly complex cells, that have they adapt to individual survival, learn to cooperate and specialize, including undergoing programmed cell death, and some of them do that, to recreate complex plants and animals. You've got some very complex factors or sequences in there it's not explained because how do they cooperate? It doesn't happen. To accept Darwinism, you have to believe nothing produces everything. Non-life produces life. Randomness produces fine-tuning. And by the way, the next time we meet, we're going to go into the fine-tuning of the universe. It is, of all the things I researched, that is the thing that absolutely blew my mind. It, it is staggering. In Lee Strobel's book, he said if there's no other issue as far as creation, that one issue would steer you. It, it's, it'll be worth it. You've got to believe chaos produces information, unconsciousness produces consciousness, and non-reason produces reason. Let's go through a few things that may still be in textbooks. Miller's experiment. Uh, he create, you know, he did an experiment, wanted to create an amino acid, basically shooting lightning or electricity through an atmosphere that supposedly simulated the early Earth. Hey, and if it created something, 
a life, an amino acid, that just proves that life could have started spontaneously. However, he chose a hydrogen-rich, rich moisture, methane, ammonia, and water vapor, which was consistent with what scientists thought back then. This was like in the 50s. By the mid-1970s, scientists said, no, the atmosphere wasn't like that. Very little hydrogen. It was mostly carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. You know, I mentioned last week what you'll have making front page headlines. Scientists discover the missing link, or scientists have discovered that something could have happened to prove evolution, and then in a footnote in a scientific journal, three years later, it'll be never mind. That's, that's the way it occurred. Uh, a couple of pictures, but basically, I mean, it's actually a good experiment. It, if it worked, I mean, it, it made sense. You know, something simulate the early Earth, you have water vapor, you zap it to simulate lightning, and voila, you had an amino acid, and he got one, like I said, but it was kind of stacked the deck. Another thing, a little easier to read, <coughs> illustrating it, and you have that. Like I said, not only was that uh, off as far as the atmosphere, but Jonathan Wells said it's still incredibly far off from being a living cell. You need the right number and right kinds of amino acids to link to form one protein molecule. Then you need dozens of these molecules, again, in the right sequence, which is critical, to create a living cell. The odds against this are astonishing. And we went through that last week, you know, the amino acids, you know, about the monkeys typing Hamlet. Um, the Achilles heel of the evolutionary theory, we're, we're going to see this in a moment. The idea that undirected processes could somehow turn dead chemicals into all the extraordinary complexity of living things is surely no more nor less than the great cosmogenic myth of our times. But Miller's experiment still makes its way to some textbooks. Yet this one, no current theory or on the origin of life can withstand scientific scrutiny. But you start saying that God did it, or was created by God. Scientists knew that they actually had gotten cut out of peer journals, peer review journals, lost their jobs because they had the audacity to say, well, I think it was intelligent design. Greg Easterbrook said science doesn't have the slightest idea how life began. No generally accepted theory exists. And the steps leading from a barren primordial world to the fragile chemistry of life seem imponderable. Now, those people are not friendly to evolution. But get these. Uh, Professor Paul Davis, evolutionarist, says nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals <coughs> spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. Harvard professor of biology, Andrew No said we re don't really know how life originated on this planet. That's what they're going to say. But it happened, so it was evolution. And I think this actually was from our friends at uh, either Institute of Creation Research or creation.com. A minimal cell needs several hundred proteins, even if every cell in the universe were an experiment with every amino acid present for every possible molecular vibration in an evolutionary age, not even one average size protein won't happen. Another thing, has anybody ever seen this in textbook? It may still be in textbook. Ernest Heckel, embryos, says, hey, look, all these embryos are the same. Humans are over here. You've got, you know, salamanders and pigs in there and, you know, other things. Look, they all start out the same. Those weren't the actual photos. These are the real embryos. This is what he said, you know, rabbit, chicken, turtle, whatever. Those are what they actually look like. And this is back in the 1860s. Heckel's colleagues accused him of fraud in the 1860s. And they were actually correct. He cherry-picked the examples to say, okay, which, which ones look the same? He claimed the embryos that you saw were in the early stages, but that's not accurate. 
Embryos start out vastly different, then there's an hourglass effect. During the mid stages, that's when a lot of embryos look closer together. And then they, uh, after that, they look completely different. This is still shown in some bio biology textbooks. Much to the chagrin of evolutionists like Stephen J. Gould, who's, you know, he, he knows that it just kind of blows, it discredits a lot of things. Another one, oh, another missing link. Archipteryx. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that's the first and only time I will try it, so that, that thing. You know, people find this fossil and says, oh look, it looks like a reptile, but it looks like a bird. We have found the link. This thing was a reptile that became a bird, or you know, it was, it was in that lineage. You know, and it looks like it. Well, the more they look, like I said, this is one of those things that makes headlines and then it's discarded. Archipteryx is a bird, according, it's a, several people said that it's a bird. It's got fully developed wings and feathers. It's different from reptiles in many important ways. Breeding systems, bone structures, lungs, distribution of weight and, uh, and lungs. Actually, I've been there twice. Uh, according to uh, Larry Martin, paleontologist, it's not an ancestor of any modern birds. Instead, a member of a totally extinct group of birds. That's, that was it, that was a picture of it. Um, because it had teeth. Well, fossils of other birds have shown that they had teeth also. Also, you know, on the ends of the feathers, they, the wings, they had claws. Well, there is the uh, South American bird that, whatever that's pronounced. Anyway, there is a current bird that has claws at the end of wings. It is a bird, though. It's not anywhere, anything in the middle. The origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. None. And then, the, even an evolutionist, Pierre, whatever, said, we are not even authorized to consider that this is a true link. An animal displaying characters belonging to two different groups cannot be treated as a true link as long as the intermediary stages have not been found and as long as the mechanisms of transition remain unknown. In other words, if we don't, if we can't link this to something else, to something else, and do, we cannot say that this is uh, in an evolutionary link. <sighs> Once again, textbooks full of uh, fossils you know, proving that evolution exists. Remember the author I mentioned last time that said, you know, why do people believe in conspiracy theories and space aliens and in cre creation? You know, when the fossils clearly show that it was, um, you know, evolution. Well, they don't. The lack of fossils in tr of transitional types was Darwin's biggest problem. In the 150 years of fossil discovery since Darwin, it has become a bigger problem. He thought the number of intermediate and transitional links must have been inconceivably great, and he would be exactly correct in that. Well, that, that is, they would be exactly correct. If you had, well, like the ones we just showed, if that were actually the link, you wouldn't have one fossil, you'd have bunches of fossils, and it would be all sorts of links. What you would have, you would have paleontologists and anthropologists arguing over which fossils came first. They would have entire conferences on, no, I think this group of fossils was this many millions of years old, and this group was actually, you got the order wrong. They, it's something they'd argue about. Trust me, I've, I've seen enough science they would. People with PhDs would just go back and forth, you know, because they would be arguing, because you'd have all these transitional fossils. I mean, if you're talking small steps, you know, copious DNA errors, you know, flip-flopping something, you're going to have some micro steps. Those fossils don't exist. And they, they'll never exist. Fossils have never yielded any type of Darwin's 
myriad of transitional forms. That's just what I said. Their absence remains one of the most striking characteristics of the fossil record. In other words, they're gone. By the way, this is probably more for the age of the earth thing. I think it's interesting you've got fish fossils next to a land animal. What's that evidence of? A cataclysmic flood with a lot of underwater mudslides, which they discount as a myth. But anyway, we'll save that for the last week. Uh, Stephen J. Gould, I mentioned him. Uh, he said two characteristics of a fossil record, and he's an evolutionist, are inconsistent with the idea of gradual change in generations. Stasis. Species exhibit no change during their tenure on Earth. They appear in the fossil record just like they disappear. Sudden appearance in any local area, a species does not arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears, oh, it's a fully formed whatever. One of the most striking things, the fossil record shows a rapid appearance of major groups of animals and, di uh, and differences, actually of animals and uh, families. They appear fully developed. It's a Cambrian explosion or the biological <coughs> big bang. What this is from, there is a fossil find in Cambria, Wales. And they found all these fossils and they go, oh. You've got all the major animal groups in this one fossil find, and they're all fully formed. How did that happen? Fossil discoveries in the last 150 years show that the Cambrian explosion was even more abrupt and extensive than scientists thought. By the way, Darwin knew about this. He said it was trouble. But he just thought they'd eventually find more and more fossils. It's been called the single most spectacular phenomenon in the fossil record. Evolutionists propose sudden jumps to new life forms called punctuated equilibrium. Like I said, let's just change the whole theory. All, well, hey, evolution happened all at once. How about that? that? That's exactly what they're saying. It's like my example of the A track. Somebody accidentally, randomly sent instructions for a CD player that wasn't included yet. But uh, that's what they say. Attempts to explain it all away by saying that the transitional forms are too small or delicate to be preserved has been disproved because people have found even soft tissue and they said, well, they were just too small. They've actually found smaller fossils in other places. Once again, evolutionary biologists. Henry Gee said, no fossil is buried with his first certificate. That and scarcity of fossils means that it is effectively impossible to link fossils into chains of cause and effect in any valid way. But if you look at the textbooks, you will find fossils that say it started here. And see all these fossil links. But that's, this is somebody said, that's not true. To take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis. Not even a theory. Gareth Nelson of the American Museum of Natural History says the idea that one could go to a fossil record and expect to empirically recover an ancestor descended sequence, be it of species, gen genera, families, or whatever, has been and continues to be a pernicious illu illusion. And yet that is what is taught in so many of our textbooks as uh, Nancy Albert said last week from middle school up. Roger Levin, uh, they did a conference on macroevolution. The central question was whether the mechanisms underlying microevolution to be, can be extrapolated, in other words, little incremental changes, to explain the phenomenon of macroevolution at the risk of doing violence to the position of people at the meeting the answer can be given a clear no. People meeting to discuss this said, no, I don't think it can happen. And a lot of these things, they'll throw out like the peppered moth over in England. Apparently, where there's a lot of, it changed colors. Well, when there's a lot of soot in the area, it, it became darker. 
you know, more camouflage. So it, it became lighter. You know, they're just temporary changes. The uh, Galapagos Islands, the reason people measured feats of birds that survived a severe drought. Oh, they had longer beaks. That's a, I don't know why they gave them an advantage, but they said it did. Well, guess what happened when the rains came back to normal? The beaks went, they measured all the birds, the beaks went back to what they would expect. After more than 100 ex years of experimental breeding, the amount of variation is extremely limited due to the limit, limited range of genetic variation. Uh, this is, you know, they'll breed these super breeds, but look what happens when they return to the wild state. The most highly specialized breeds quickly perish and the survivors revert to the original wild type. If living things look like they were designed, how do evolutionists know that they were not? Why should science be limited to naturalistic causes and not consider logical causes? Jonathan Wells says, scientists have never been able to produce Darwinian evolution by mutating an embryo. And in other words, in the embryo stage to insert genetic changes to produce a, you know, a whole different species. The only way to construct an evolutionary tree from molecules in living organisms is to assume Darwinian, Darwinianism is true and then fit the data into a branch tree pattern. I'll come back to this, that in a second. I just, that first one, I happen to think there is an experiment people can do where they take a fruit fly and do some genetic change. And what happens is you have a fruit fly that instead of antennas coming out of its head, it's got an extra set of legs coming out of its head. They can do that. But guess what? It's a fruit fly not going to involve anything else, and I don't know why a fruit fly won't leg out of its head, but anyway, they, you know, but that's the type of thing that happened. It's not, they can't produce this thing. Uh, Ken Ham, who started Answers in Genesis, was on a debate on TV with somebody years ago, and he asked an evolutionist, give your best case right now for evolution. And the guy mentioned something about different types of salmon, you know, you know, being produced, you know, genetic changes. He said, yeah, but they're still all salmon. And like I said, the only way they say, they assume Darwinism is true, and then they make the data fit. This is confession time, kind of like when I was in college and I had physics labs. You had three hours to do the physics lab, and the first eh, couple hours or so would be the actual experiment. We'd be working in groups, and we would get to the end of a couple hours and do all the calculations go, guys, guess what? This isn't the answer we should have got. We'd already done the experiment, we got, we came out with something a whole lot different than what we should have got. So you gotta turn it all in in three hours, so you got a choice. Do you try to do the experiment over again and get it right? Or could you say, listen, we know what the answer is supposed to be. You work on this part, crunch some numbers, see what it needs to be, you know, to get where we need to go, and you get the other part and so we chose option B. For the next hour, we were crunching numbers and everything. Everybody working on a different section, we'd come and we knew what the answer was supposed to be. We made it fit. Like I said, I was not saved by the way. So <laughs> I can confess that. But I think most people here would have probably done the very same thing. Uh, bacteriologist Alan Linton found no literature claiming direct evidence that one species evolved into another. Bacteria would be perfect for this because of the short generation span, but in 150 years, no evidence that one species of bacteria changed into another, neither evidence of evolution from bacteria to plant and animal cells. Uh, you may not be able to read this. Uh, the statistical model, and these authors wrote this book, wrote a book in the mid-70s. <coughs> Generous assumptions. The probability of one enzyme molecule would develop in each of the last 100 billion years. And what they did, they very generous assumptions as far as the soil type, the atmosphere, things like that. One in 80 billion. Now the probability of finding two active 
uh, is 10 to the 22nd power. I didn't know how to write that. It's a big number. It's one followed by 22 zeros, okay? The probability that they are identical, which you have to have for the DNA sequence and all that, is 10 to the 70th power, in other words, 70 zeros. Once formed, what is the probability that it can find its way through thousands of miles, millions of years, to that randomly formed RNA sequence that would match it, or DNA molecule that contains the code for that enzyme to repeat itself? In all practical purposes, zero. That's why the mathematician said, you know, it takes billions of times longer than three billion, and it still wouldn't happen. We all know, and I hope this lines up on this. First, I've got to find the line. We all know that you don't base very, very important things on incredibly long odds. If you can't hear this, let me know. So, uh, this is my friend Frank and his uh, <coughs> retirement plan. One golden crown. Come on, Frank. Yeah. How long have we known each other? Go to E-Trade. They got killer tools, man. They'll help you nail a retirement plan that's fierce. Two golden crowns. You realize the odds of winning are the same as being mauled by a polar bear and a regular bear in the same day? Frank! Oh, wow. You, you didn't win? I want to show you something. It's my shocked face. <laughs> Get a retirement plan that works. Any we know this. You don't do that. Jonathan Wells said this, never in the field of science have so many based so much on so little. The naturalist formula says nobody times nothing equals everything. If evolution is true, and this is from an evolutionist, there's no evidence of God, no life after death, no absolute foundation for right and wrong, no ultimate meaning of life, People don't have a free will. Where does evolution lead us? And this and that, evolution and ethics are incompatible. If it's all natural selection, survival of the fittest, random, everything's random, what's wrong with robbery, murder, you know, anything like this? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with taking money from old folks or you know, killing babies or whatever? What's wrong with all that? If, if there's no higher power. But these next two, within the universe, and this is Richard Dawkins, a very strong advocate for evolution and atheism. Within the universe, there's no design, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless existence. And then the late Carl Sagan says, our planet is a lonely speck in this great enveloping cosmic dark. In our, our obscurity and all this vastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. You know, we tend to, like I said last week, we've got to be careful not to think of these people as the enemy. The true enemy is Satan, who has deceived people. When I read that, I think about it and say, yeah, I don't see any hope. Here are two people who devoted almost their entire lives to be telling people that there was no God and trying to steer people using science away from God. Even though what we're trying to show is that science is, you know, we love science, but they were not using true science. But they tried to steer people away from God. And they're admitting right there that there's no hope. They have no hope. There are people that have gone to school that have not been raised in a Christian environment, not gone to church, they had bought into this. Uh, Lee Strobel, I mentioned his book, he was a, a Chicago boy, and then a uh, journalist, great journalist, award winning journalist. <coughs> he was sent to cover a textbook controversy in West Virginia. You know, all, all these backwoods hicks, you know, that believe in creation, all this type of stuff, and you know, that was his first exposure to that. His wife became a Christian. 
And he thought, okay, I need to look at this further. And he interviewed all these people and came to the conclusion, yes, there's a God, there's a creator, his name's Jesus, and he died. But he fought into all this. You know, all those things I showed you, heckles, embryos, all that, he said, what, all this isn't true? I had all this in high school. There are people we work with, neighbors with, others that have been taught this. They think life is a pitiless existence. They believe there's no hope coming from anywhere. What they need to see is Christians around them living the victorious life, the abundant life that Jesus promised. Because unfortunately there's way too many Christians or professing Christians, you can't tell the difference. They act like it's a pitiless existence. So we got to live that life and be open to witness because somebody's going through a hard time, somebody's going to see Christians that have difficult times like everybody else, but they see what they go through with an underlying hope and joy and peace. And they say, hey, I want what you've got. Never mind what I've been taught. I want what you've got. Let's go to theistic evolution. We've got to touch on this briefly. Theistic evolution is kind of, it's a compromise. We we'll say, well, you know, all the scientific data says this, uh, but I still believe God did it, so basically God started it all, kicked it, you know, kicked it off, and then let all these natural forces take over. Well, the New Testament speaks of a creation as a finished work, not an ongoing work. All things were made through him, Jesus, and without him was not anything made that was made. God's word means immediate response. He says, by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. That sounds a whole lot like God said it, and it happened really, really fast. Once again, instantaneous response. God said, let the waters under the uh, under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. If you believe in theistic evolution, the Bible's going to read a little different. Uh, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And after 387,492,871 attempts, God finally made a mouse that worked. Wayne Groom and systematic theology has that period. That's not the way I read Genesis. He considered it happen. Quickly, uh, there's a purposefulness in God's work. God said, according to their kinds, and it was so. Evolution, randomness is a driving force. Scripture, species have intelligent design. We can see this intelligent design. God said it was good. Random mutations are not. <coughs> and some people say, well, yeah, God, okay, God made Adam and Eve. Well, you know, once he intervened with Adam and Eve, then why couldn't he intervene everywhere else? Um, another one, in Genesis 1 2, God was brooding, the actual word here, the earth was <coughs> without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That word hovering is actually a hen sitting, brooding over eggs. That's the, that is the very first picture we have of God with his creation. That doesn't sound like God said, here, here it is, evolution, take your, take it. There's some differentiation, but there are narrow limits, because God made it according to their kind. The special creation of Adam and Eve, count as theistic evolution, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Adam and Eve had highly developed linguistic, moral, and spiritual abilities from the moment they were created. Uh, Paul based his discussion of Christ's representative work of earning salvation on Adam as a historical pattern. And the New Testament portrays Adam as a historical person. By the way, the highly developed skills, one thing you can do, you can tell 
a four-year-old go into the room, get the red ball that's sitting by the blue table, and they'll come back to the red ball. You cannot say that to an atheist or any other creature. They cannot, they just don't have that reason. Humans can do that. Wayne Grudem said, it is very difficult to believe the complete truthfulness of the Bible and hold that humans result from long evolutionary process. Eve had no female parent. That's impossible to reconcile with evolution. Once again, uh, Paul told, matter of fact, on Mars Hill, he said, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Uh, God's present and active role is definitely not consistent with the hands-off oversight. The verse is there, I'll let you do it. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God told Moses, I, I made man's mouth. What are you saying you can't speak? Jeremiah 1 5, where God said, In the womb I need you. And that also in uh, Psalm 139. God's uh, work in Psalm 104. In Job 38 42, if you haven't read that passage lately, where Job was complaining, God just told him what all he did in creation. And uh, God never told Job why he did what he did. But God just said, This is what I do. And his power in creation, and Job finally said, Okay, you're the boss. I'm gonna shut up now. That's basically it, it, that's a paraphrase, but that's basically what he said. And this is from that passage. God chooses characteristics of animals, and we'll get into this as far as the features, the selection. God didn't make set out to make everything a perfect machine. This is what God Himself said about the ostrich: For she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground. Forgetting that a foot may crush them, and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young as if they were not hers, though her labor be in vain, yet she has no fear. Because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share of understanding. Let me paraphrase that. God said, I know the ostrich is not a very smart animal. You know why? I didn't want to give it a whole lot of brains. That's, that's what that said. God says, I didn't want it to be smart. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to. But that's what he says. And this will come into play when we talk about some of the designs like human eye and stuff like that. Hey, God can do whatever he... I do. Every time I read that passage, it's, okay, I'm not going to question you, God. The last one is, this is key to all of us. Like I said, those have pitiless existence that have no hope. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. That's a big key. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. You know, Richard Dawkins. Stephen Jay Gill, Stephen Hawkins, uh, all these people, Carl Sagan, captured by the devil, trying to lead others astray, and we are to be a strong witness to this. But I guarantee you, the rest of these past few like the weeks, like I said, will not be near this path. Actually, this could have been about three times as long. I summarize entire chapters of books in one sentence. Uh, but I wanted you to get the flavor that what has been commonly out there in scientific data is not accurate. Even scientists, that's why I said, had so many quotes from scientists themselves that say, eh, I don't think this happened, but it must have. Or they can't explain why it happened. But we're going to talk about some of the details, and it is staggering some of the complexity of, of God's creation. And that, I'm really looking forward to these next three weeks because it really is exciting. Palmer, are you going to be here in two weeks? Well, I don't know. She hasn't told me. <laughs> I may need, for a first illustration, I may need you. <laughs> don't, 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 don't lose sleep over for the next two weeks. But 
I I actually, yeah. Uh, actually, I may need you for that illustration in the next. Uh, that before or after revolution. <laughs> <laughs> but we will have some fun. We will have some fun the next time. But uh, no, no, you don't have to worry. I'm just. But uh, I just. You did. You know. You were very instrumental in getting this building and all the equipment here, so I may need you here. Or at least we'll talk about you. Huh? You, may have, you may have covered last week, on the last first session, but one of the things that I keep thinking about is that Darwin developed a theory of evolution, which many people have taken and tried to turn it into a law. There are theories and there are laws. Which is exactly what Lyndon Jones told me after. And, and, you know, they want to forget that Darwin had a theory. Therefore, there, are, there can be opposing theories. And actually, we mentioned that uh, some evolutionists, some quotes that said, hey, it's a fact. And why can't these backwards, they didn't say this, backwards Baptist kids believe it? But that's kind of what one of them implied last, the last time. Yes, it is a theory. Matter of fact, the state of Alabama has a disclaimer on the biological textbooks required that says this is a theory. Of course, it's the very front. You know, I don't know what's called after that, but you know, they actually, at least at the beginning, get it right. So thank you very, very much. But like I said, sometimes you just need to have the cold, hard truth on some of this stuff. I know it's getting right at uh, that time, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the source of all truth. Uh, thank you for revealing the truth to us. Father, I pray that we would lovingly speak to others about truth. And Lord, Father, that you would help us to minister to people, to live the abundant life, to show people that there is hope. And Lord, that we would help steer people away from error and bring them to to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ.